Good morning to day three. Uh, happy to have you here again. Uh, hope that uh, the sessions have been good for you so far, but keep posting your questions on the Slack channel. Uh, we heard from uh, Matt Norman that he finished the open ACC session yesterday and has no more to present. So we're going to advance the schedule and jump right into CUDA. But uh, if you have any lingering open ACC questions, please go ahead and post them. And with that, then uh, we're going to let John Stone start with CUDA. John. Thanks. So uh, originally, we were going to have more of a discussion about GPU hardware in the Monday session about uh, different uh, hardware systems and things like this, but I sort of looked through the slides and I saw that the, the coverage of GPU uh, architecture was very thin. So given that we have the extra time this morning uh, given to us by uh, Mr. Norman, I thought we'd uh, sort of touch on the key architectural concepts that make GPUs what they are, and that affects how we, you know, the strategies we use to program them. And so I think this will be really helpful for all of you when we get into the details about talking about CUDA. So, you know, GPUs uh, began life as uh, little special machines for uh, rasterization, you know, for doing computer graphics. And rasterization is an inherently data parallel workload. So you have uh, millions of pixels on the screen. And if you want to draw a triangle on that screen, there are various uh, ways that that can be done in hardware at a very low level. Um, in a very data parallel way. And so they began as very fixed function hardware uh, that had this data parallel workload. And over uh, multiple decades, they basically evolved from that fixed function hardware into uh, progressively more and more general purpose processing units. And that was sort of uh, the result of a need in computer gaming software, computer aided design software. We needed to have uh, higher fidelity rendering techniques. Inevitably, this leads back to uh, more sophisticated software. You know, doing everything in a fixed function piece of hardware was uh, limiting. And so people wanted to be able to, to do more flexible things in their graphics software, and that led these things to become uh, completely programmable computers in their own right. And so, you know, the thing that's interesting about GPUs as accelerators, maybe one of the best things that happened with GPUs is because they're a commodity device, you know, they, they are millions of GPUs sold per week. This is a big deal. This is why GPUs are an affordable accelerator option. If you look back at uh, 2006 when CUDA first came out and, and was announced at Supercomputing in 2006, back in that time period there were a lot of other competing options uh, that people were investigating as, ex as options for doing acceleration of high performance computing workloads. You've heard about FPGAs, uh, you've heard about GPUs, you've probably heard about various other kinds of accelerators that have come and gone. And one of the things that made GPUs such a good option was that they, they were already here and they existed and they were uh, built up at a massive scale, uh, sold, like I say, millions per week. And this meant that the cost of the, the GPUs and their design and their architectural advancement was being amortized, not just, you know, not just in HPC, but by all the gamers and all the people using them for computer-aided design. Uh, so that really made them um, a strong contender. Uh, adding a little bit to a GPU is a lot easier than starting from scratch with something that has no existing market or a very shallow market that doesn't uh, support such economies of scale. So uh, GPUs have you know, massively parallel hardware architecture, so they have uh, literally thousands of arithmetic logic units and your goal as a programmer is going to be to exploit all of them to the greatest degree possible. They're well suited to, toward uh, parallel programming. They're not well suited for single threaded programming. So there are things that they will never be good at. It's not a useful thing for you to spend your time on trying to uh, put some single threaded code onto a GPU that's never going to pan out. Uh, so. A difference between you know what GPUs were designed for and CPUs. CPUs are very cache heavy, and I'll, I'll show some diagrams that explain this. CPUs like to work on a small number of threads at a time, and they use uh, caches to sort of hide memory latency. GPUs have always been used for things, uh, scenes like in a computer game, 
they're so large, they, they're really impractical to put into a cache. And more importantly, a lot of what they do for computer graphics involves hammering a bunch of geometry through a long pipeline and nothing is ever reused. So caches are not nearly as beneficial for a GPU as they are for a CPU. So that means GPUs also have a very uh, intense set of memory systems. Uh, these memory systems all uh, work together collectively to give the GPU much higher bandwidth uh, than you would normally find on a typical uh, CPU-based system. With the state-of-the-art GPUs, we now have programming tools with CUDA, that allow you to write uh, parallel software in a dialect of C and C++ and, and, and Fortran, and you can basically incorporate this into your existing uh, legacy software applications. One of the interesting things I would point out is, while GPUs are a little different than what you're accustomed to, programming CPUs, one of the things that you end up learning is that by the time you have made a massively data parallel GPU algorithm, it turns out that it's usually pretty easy to exploit that same algorithm on state-of-the-art CPUs. CPUs have evolved to become a lot more, you know, a, a modern multi-core CPU of today is about, uh, in some sense, a weak version of what we had with a G80 GPU uh, 12, 13 years ago in terms of the number of cores, the number of uh, concurrent elements that they can evaluate, things like this and the number of uh, flops and so on. So there's an interesting continuum here. You really do see that over time, if you do, if you do the work to put it on a GPU, it makes it easier to, to run on a state-of-the-art CPU also. So what's, uh, what makes them uh, you know, sort of different? So unlike uh, CPU, GPUs are very heavily SIMD-oriented for everything they do. So CPUs have, you know, they can do scalar instructions that just operate on a single operand or a couple of operands. GPUs basically at their roots want to work on a large number of data parallel items. That's just how they're, they're literally hardwired to work this way. And so they have a bunch of, I guess you could call them SIMD cores. Uh, you know, if you, if you read NVIDIA's literature, they will call them uh, each of the arithmetic units they would call a CUDA core and they give it that funny name because it's not really a separate core but it's a it's a lane in a large SIMD multi-threaded piece of hardware and what you really care about is to keep a GPU busy you have to give it tens of thousands of independent work units uh, to saturate all the hardware that it contains so the GPU has all these different ALUs. It has a bunch of different uh, groupings of those uh, called streaming multiprocessors or SMs in NVIDIA's nomenclature. And your goal is to basically stripe a whole bunch of work across all those functional units all at the same time. Uh, to make this work fast, the GPU has a large uh, register files. It has uh, on-chip die-stacked memory and some of the state-of-the-art voltage chips, so this makes them extremely fast. So just to give you an example, uh, Tesla V100, this is a Volta. This is what's in uh, Summit at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, it can achieve 7.5 teraflops and 64-bit floating point, 15 teraflops and 32-bit single precision floating point. Uh, if you're able to use a tensor core to do things like uh, the convolutions for deep learning neural networks, if you have the right shape matrix and everything lines up, you can hit uh, flop rates as high as 100, uh, 120 teraflops in half precision. That's pretty amazing. Um, and then uh, these use die stacked memory. So that means the, the GPU chip itself is put on a little substrate, a little uh, sort of like a cracker. And on this cracker, besides the GPU processor, you have a bunch of little uh, memory units, and they're actually stacked on the same interposer. And what's special about that is they are much more tightly coupled than you would normally have in a typical uh, gaming GPU or in any other memory system you've ever seen on a, a typical CPU. And this allows them to achieve almost a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. This is the highest memory bandwidth I've ever heard of on any conventional processor, so that's awesome. So you can go uh, read about the details of Volta on this URL below. That's something maybe during a break or during lunch, it's worth uh, digging into that and, and sort of exploring all the different interesting hardware features that Volta has. Um, to give you sort of a background, you know, the trend that we have, if you look at a conventional CPUs, 
shown in the blue lines at the bottom, those are single and double precision performance, with single obviously being higher performance than double. And the same thing shown for the Tesla class, green lines are the Tesla class uh, GPUs, and these go up to about 2015. I mean, there's really not much to say except for you see they're both on an exponential trend, but the GPUs are advancing at a much faster rate, and part of that is simply because they're not constrained by the existing programming model of a small number of threads. Not, you know, I don't want to pick on Intel and AMD too hard, but basically one of the detractions from CPUs, or one of the things that holds them back in terms of flop rate is, if you only have four or eight threads, and you only have SIMD vectors that are, say, eight elements wide, it's difficult to extract the kinds of performance that we can get from a GPU because you don't have as much parallelism to start with. And parallelism is a lot easier to exploit than trying to increase clock rates or in instructions per clock or various other schemes to make the hardware fast. So the GPU sort of takes the, I'd say, the easy path, you might say, not to, not to take anything away from the hardware architects, but they are using the transistors that are on that chip to give you a massively parallel piece of hardware, and so they are spending the majority of their transistors on giving you arithmetic hardware. They're not spending them on caches, out-of-order execution, or other fancy hardware features that are absolutely critical to the performance of a CPU, but because we have, a, just by de definition, we have a massively parallel device, we don't do any of those things. So a GPU is very energy efficient. That's a, another thing that's different about it. It's spending all that logic on massive parallelism. It is not spending it on fancy tricks or other schemes to get more uh, instructions per clock. <clears throat> Same thing with memory bandwidth. GPUs, by having more of a fixed uh, memory system design, you know, with a, with a conventional CPU, uh, Intel sells CPUs for all kinds of things. And, you know, the customer doesn't really ask Intel or tell them, you know, I, I need exactly this many gigabytes of memory. So we build these motherboards that have slots in them so that you can expand the amount of uh, memory the machine has, but there are all sorts of disadvantages to doing that by making that memory uh, user expandable, uh, you have now lowered its performance because there are, now you have these sockets and they're not as perfect, electrically speaking, as something that was hardwired. And it's at a larger distance, so there's more speed of light delay, just uh, the signals crossing the motherboard and going to that memory controller and back. So everything about the expandability of a conventional CPU motherboard is against performance. So GPUs, obviously, are not like that. GPUs, you cannot expand the memory. You buy the GPU with whatever memory capacity you want. If you want more memory, you have to buy a higher-end GPU. Uh, and there's no way to expand that later. But the payoff for that is that memory is hardwired. It's as close to that processor chip as it can possibly get. And uh, you're, you're going to extract a massively wide memory bus that would be you know, to be fair to the CPU guys, it's just not practical to do this across a big motherboard that's a foot uh, wide. You can't do that. It's not, uh, you don't have that many traces on the motherboard. But if you do it right on the processor die or on a die stacked system, or you do it on a GPU, if you look at the backside of a GPU, you'll see where the, the big processor is and there's like a C-shaped ring around it. All of the RAM is right next to the processor. That's as good as you're ever going to get. And, and they can do that because it is not upgradable. Its mission in life is to be fast, and it will, it will either be fast or it will die trying. And so that's sort of the, the difference in philosophy. And so the payoff is you get memory bandwidths that are on the order of five to ten times faster than what you have on a CPU. Uh, for, and, and this is important if you have a problem that doesn't fit in caches. You know, CPUs have caches. So if your problem is tiny, they do run really fast, right? But if you have a big problem that's uh, gigabytes in size, no cache is going to hold that, and that's where this memory bandwidth is really important. So doing uh, your linear algebra kernels, for example, is a great example. <coughs> if you look at the last few generations of GPUs, these are sort of the GPU hardware architectures that we've had during the time that Blue Waters has been in service. So if you look at the left hand of the chart there, a Tesla K40 is quite similar to what's in Blue Waters. Blue Waters has uh, K20X GPUs. A K40 is just basically a descendant of the K20. It's got a few more uh, compute elements. It's a little higher clock rate, a little faster. <clears throat> 
Um, but what's interesting is, so that's over a, about a seven or eight year time frame. You can see we've uh, tripled the performance or more in uh, single and double precision. And, and look at the double precision. It's amazing how much more we're getting now uh, than we were back then. And uh, so this is sort of the rate of growth we've seen. We have seen nothing like that on CPUs. So this is an interesting thing to observe because it means that over the lifetime of, of GPU accelerated software, assuming that NVIDIA can keep doing this, um, you're going to have a challenge with Amdahl's law. You might, if you began with a, a piece of hardware like the Tesla K40 at 1.7 teraflops and you ended up here now today at 7.5, and you had some balanced code, like you did a certain fraction of your work on the GPU and a certain fraction on the CPU, that fraction has shifted, or the, the fraction of performance coming from those uh, different hardware devices has shifted a lot from the K40 to uh, Volta. And so if you were uh, maintaining that code over a long period of time, like I do for my application, you will have had to put more of your work on the GPU to keep things balanced all things being equal, because although we've seen that peak flop rate improve tremendously on the GPUs, we haven't seen the same uh, gains on the, on the CPU. It's worth noting, like I said, GPUs, not only are they fast, but it, by virtue of sort of uh, foregoing energy inefficient or energy costly hardware designs that are, you know, they are absolutely needed on CPUs uh, to make single or small numbers of threads run fast. Uh, on GPUs, we don't do those things. So GPUs are, it's the simplest hardware that they can make that costs the fewest number of gates, uses the fewest watts, and as a result, uh, they are very energy efficient machines. So the 22 of the top 25 green 500 machines are GPU machines as of June this year. Um, so they get more gigaflops per watt. Uh, they, you know, generally speaking, they have a better efficiency overall. If, if you're able to run code on a GPU accelerated system, this is one of the benefits you can hope to achieve. Uh, achieve. Um, some of the cool things about GPUs then are that uh, as a result of their, you know, sort of uh, power efficiency and compactness, you can put a GPU in a desktop workstation and have quite a powerful workstation. You know, it, it's inconceivable a few years ago to have workstations that had multiple teraflops of compute, but now that's actually possible. So imagine if you're doing uh, radio astronomy out in the middle of a desert somewhere and you have to run machines off of a diesel generator because you're out in the outback of Australia, uh, you know, having a very energy efficient but powerful machine is an important thing to keep in mind. So there are challenging environments where we want to do things that are bordering on uh, conventional high performance computing. And if you, if you have a way of doing that at low power, that's, uh, that's important to keep in mind. So great, uh, I've, I've made a good sales pitch for GPUs, hopefully. But what, what don't they do? Uh, so they aren't gonna make your serial code run faster. <laughs> so if you have some uh, important algorithmic step in your science code that is totally serial, uh, you're not going to get anything out of, the, uh, of a GPU for that. Uh, the, that's going to be a bad choice to run on the GPU, obviously. Uh, and what I would say is it's time for you to look for alternatives. It might be shocking, but you might be better off running a very inefficient uh, parallel algorithm on a GPU, work, work inefficient, I mean, would be perhaps faster than using a very work efficient serial algorithm. There are often trade-offs, you know, when you do a parallel algorithm versus a serial one, I've, I've got a number of examples I've run across over the years where there is some perfect serial algorithm. It is absolutely the most work efficient algorithm that is known to man uh, because you're processing elements one at a time. And, if, and of course, if you're doing them in parallel, sometimes you're gonna do some step that's extra work because you're, uh, that worker doesn't know about some other worker's intermediate result. And so the parallel algorithm may not be, uh, from a certain perspective, the absolute most work efficient algorithm, but it may be the fastest algorithm by far because you're able to tear through the entire data set at once. And, <coughs> and given the speed and the efficiency of the hardware, it's probably worth it to do it as a, as a parallel algorithm. And I can guarantee you going forward, uh, if you want your code to run faster, it's going to have to be parallelized on something, whether it's a GPU or otherwise. So, 
I would say now is the time to start uh, dealing with those serial loops if you haven't already. Um, GPUs don't run your operating system, so they don't really, you know, they have a very simple work scheduler. So they are able to uh, juggle multiple kernels running at the same time. They can do asynchronous copies, so they can do uh, kernel computing things at the same time that you're transferring data to or from the host. You can run multiple kernels at the same time under the right conditions and they will actually juggle that work and disperse different work to the different processing units that are on the GPU. Uh, but they can't do things like I.O. without help from the host machine. There are, there are lots of things like, the, you know, they don't run file system code. They don't know anything about disk files really. And so there is always going to be some interaction between the GPU and your host operating system. Fortunately, we have CPUs for that. And if you have offloaded the majority of the heavy lifting to the GPU, your CPU is now more available to do these other tasks. <coughs> so while the GPU may not make your I.O. faster uh, by direct action, the very fact that you're offloading the host may permit that host to be more effective at doing the things it does well. And of course, the last thing is, uh, you know, G uh, GPUs aren't going to solve Amdahl's law. If your CPU code has got bottlenecks, it is, uh, you know, running this stuff on a GPU is just going to expose them to a greater degree. Whatever your, your bottleneck is, is going to be more apparent after you've ported the code to the GPU than it probably was before. So I would say, you know, heterogeneous computing is the sort of terminology we use when we uh, talk about algorithms that use a mix of conventional uh, sequential or, or um, small core count CPUs with uh, massively parallel GPUs who sort of have multiple hardware architectures. And so we want to use the right processor for the right task and we want to try and use all of the system resources to the greatest efficiency possible. Um, and uh, so that just basically means using the right tool for the right job. You know, decomposing your code into the right pieces so that they, you're running things that make sense on the host and trying to run a, the largest fraction possible on the GPU. So I said I would uh, describe how CPUs and GPUs spend their hardware resources. This is an oversimplification, but it's sort of representative of reality. If you look at the uh, above uh, figures here, on the left, we have sort of a, a conventional CPU with a moderate core count. So let's pretend this is, a, let's say, a four core CPU or something like this. Uh, basically, your CPU has a small number of these uh, ALU blocks. And these could be considered uh, the fundamental units that are in one of your vector units or, or one of your scalar uh, pipelines. The control block is what decodes machine instructions and tells the different arithmetic units what to do. The cache is basically there to hide latency to DRAM. So I don't know how many of you uh, know the details about how modern microprocessors work, but DRAM, you know, it, it is not fast. There, is, there was a time period about 30 years ago where DRAM was fast enough to keep up with the processors of the day that time has long since passed and to keep the processors fed with data uh, with operands as fast as your code is running all of the conventional microprocessors we use today cover a huge gap in performance by using these caches now cpus because they run a small number of uh, concurrent threads and uh, of moderate size vectors of of work they are able to largely cover this latency. They, they are largely dependent on that cache to achieve what you would think of as a, uh, an effective memory bandwidth that is large enough to do the work that you assign them to do. They do a great job when you have a working set or a problem size that fits inside that cache. But if that problem size gets too big or there's no reuse, let's say we have uh, three arrays and you write a simple loop that says A of I equals B of I plus C of I. All I have to do is have that loop uh, extend on an array that's far larger than that cache and very quickly that cache will give me no benefit at all and it will actually potentially slow me down. And so in that case we, we are memory bandwidth bound and not even the caches on the CPU can help us. And so that's a case where this cache design sort of breaks down. It doesn't help us anymore once you get to that uh, scenario. Uh, 
most business software, Microsoft Word, all of your video games, they tend to fit in the cache. So life is good for them. But for us doing HPC, uh, many of you are working with uh, arrays that are you know, many, many gigabytes in size, far larger than any cache will ever be. So if, you, if in some iterative uh, algorithm you walk that entire array as part of a solver or something like this, and you make a single pass through it, uh, that's something that a cache can't help you with. GPUs, as you can see, there, there are little control units and there are little tiny caches, but they're microscopic. So they, they are helpful to the GPU for keeping uh, very small operands in uh, cache, things like this, but they aren't going to make any serious attempt at doing what a CPU does. So even something that's several megabytes, the GPU just doesn't even bother. It goes straight to the memory system. But the difference is the GPU has a massively wide path, so it may have a 512-bit memory bus going to the DRAM, and it is able to, you know, it has to overcome some latency, just like the CPU did, but it takes a very different strategy. Instead of using a cache to cover that latency, the GPU is uh, multi-threaded. So every one of these green arithmetic units you see there, that's uh, one of these workers that can do some arithmetic. If they depend on an operand that is not yet loaded from memory. You know, in a conventional processor, if, if you miss the cache, you, you stall. You just sit there doing nothing until the memory system finally responds, right? Uh, in a GPU, that's not what we do. What we do is we give them so much work that every one of those green boxes, rather than just having one work unit to do, it may have five or it may have ten, and by overloading it with work, by flooding this machine with work, we are giving them enough work to do that they can actually sit there and juggle five or ten tasks. And so this is where hardware multi-threading comes in. So they actually have hardware, uh, hardware level multi-threading to a degree that when they do a load from DRAM and the DRAM it hasn't responded yet, they keep track of that, they put it on a little scoreboard, and they basically say, who else, you know, who else can I run? What other thread can I run of the 10 that I ha I'm juggling here? Is there any thread for which I have the necessary operands ready to go? And they will immediately switch and run that thread at a hardware level so this context switch is effectively free as far as you're concerned. It is so nearly free that it, it is uh, essentially something that as a programmer you don't even think about. This is something you're getting uh, by benefit of the design of the hardware. So this is great. This means that we don't have to have a cache to hide memory latency. We just have to have enough work that we can hide the memory latency. So that's why a GPU wants, aside from the fact that it has thousands of these ALUs, that's why the other reason why we want tens of thousands of items of work to pr uh, pr provide it enough work to hide its own latency. And so this way, we're getting high utilization of all those ALUs. We're not spending die area on that chip on things like caches. We're spending it on arithmetic hardware. And that's why we have so many teraflops of performance is because we have a different strategy. We, we're spending that hardware on flops, not on caches. But to do that, we have to have tens of thousands of threads, not four. <laughs> so that's the trade-off. That's the principal issue here. So when you think of a GPU, you should think of thousands and thousands of work units. If you have less than 10,000 things to do, it's not even worth waking up the GPU out of its sleep. You should, you should do it some other way. You want to have 10 to 100,000 work units is a good range for bothering to send something to the GPU. So it's very fine-grained parallelism. This is not MPI. This is down at the level of, you know, every single one of those ALUs might work on a different array element. So in that example I gave you, A of I equals B of I plus C of I, I might farm out the entire operation across the entire GPU. So if I have 10 billion elements in the array, I'd just launch that as a kernel, and every one of those ALUs will get loaded up with several different work units, and they'll each handle one of those things, one of those work items. And that's basically how we're going to use this hardware. So uh, the challenge in using a GPU in part is, so now we have these radically different types of processors. I mean, you know, they contain the same hardware units in some sense. They do have caches. They do have ALUs. 
you can run the same code on both kinds of hardware, but they have these very different attributes. You know, using a GPU well and using a CPU well are, are very different. And we want to decompose our problem uh, to best match the right hardware. Another thing that's interesting is, of course, we have now for the first time a disjoint memory system. We have the CPU has its, own, its memory system, its caches, its DRAM, and the GPU has its own uh, onboard DRAM, its own caches, and so on. And now we have to pay attention to where is our data? Where is the data that we're operating on? Is it in the GPU memory or is it in the host memory? And if it's in one or the other memories, do I have to transfer it while my, pro my uh, program is running? Do I have to uh, change how it, the data is laid out because the GPU wants it to be laid out one way and the CPU wants it laid out another way? So there's costs associated with those things. And this is where you have to pay attention to the, the interconnect performance between the GPU and the host and the different host CPU sockets and all these things. So I won't get into all this just this, this moment, but basically as we decompose our problem, <clears throat> not only do we care about the attributes of the processing elements themselves and the type of code that they prefer to run, but we have to know what the topology and their interconnectedness is how fast these different links are, and how can we decompose our problems so that we minimize the traversal of those links. Because, you know, I just gave you an example where a state-of-the-art Volta with die-stacked memory has an onboard memory bandwidth of a terabyte a second almost. But if it were communicating with a host at, over PCI Express, uh, you'd be limited to 12 gigabytes a second. That's a couple orders of magnitude difference in performance. So you don't want to have to move that data at all if you can possibly avoid it. So that, just keep that in the back of your mind. So the major schemes, you know, for programming GPUs, I would say, are the following. You know, you begin, as I said yesterday, you start by looking for GPU accelerated libraries. You can do, if you have a, a piece of code that uses a lot of dense linear algebra, you can actually accomplish a lot just by using kubloss, uh, kusolve, uh, and, you know, using Magma or various of the other um, open and uh, commercially provided CUDA libraries. These can be used within whatever code you want, whether it's C code or Fortran. Um, and by dropping those libraries in, they've already been architected to take advantage of the GPU to the maximum extent uh, that the engineers uh, were able. And you get to exploit all of their hard work. And so your job then is just keeping track of where your data is. So. If you use libraries, you might want to pay attention more to this top level figure. If most of your program's work is in library calls, if it's all uh, dense linear algebra, then the, mo the most important thing for you is keeping the data where the work will be the fastest. So if it's going to be done on the GPUs, you want to keep the data uh, on those GPUs and try to minimize the number of times it has to go across various of those slow buses. That makes your job pretty easy if, you're, if most of your performance comes out of libraries. Now, some of us aren't so lucky. I work in molecular modeling, and in our field, uh, basically none of our performance comes out of libraries. <laughs> so that means the only way we're going to extract performance out of something like a GPU is to write special code. And uh, there are no libraries for what we do, and, and it, well, it's really, I would say, somewhat unlikely there, there ever will be uh, much in the way of libraries. And so we end up writing uh, special code for a, a large part of what we do. That gives us a few options. So then I would say you can make, if you have some existing CPU code, one of the low barrier ways of starting out that you've already heard of uh, is to use directive-based parallelism. So this is uh, schemes like OpenMP or OpenACC. And the value of that is uh, you know, those methods, while they're not necessarily going to give you the peak performance that the hardware is capable of, they are pretty good and they're less disruptive to your code in the early phases of your development. So, you know, it isn't your, your first step, no matter which way you end up going, your first step is not going to be achieving 99% of the peak flop rate. Let me just tell you that from the outset. That's not really your goal. Your goal is to initially uh, you know, get all of the hardware utilized, get your program uh, in a very data parallel way, and your goal would be to reach a point where your code is memory bandwidth bound at, at some point. So 
And then, you know, when you get to the point that you're being held back by the GPU memory bandwidth, that's already pretty darn good. That's many times faster than the fastest CPU already, so you, you should be already happy at that point in a lot of cases. For some codes, that's as far as they can go. If you're working on uh, huge arrays that are, you know, half a terabyte in size, you're going to be memory bandwidth bound. That's largely uh, the outcome for you. On the other hand, there are a lot of codes, uh, like in our case in molecular modeling, we are not working on a uh, half a terabyte data set. We might be working on something that's a few megabytes, but we have a heck of a lot of flops. For our code, we actually can do a lot by getting very detailed in our use of those arithmetic units, and it's difficult with a directive-based parallelism to extract all the performance that's possible because there are all kinds of little tricks we can do that uh, give us a further edge. And so in, in those specific cases, one can go after uh, using CUDA or OpenCL to start extracting performance that's difficult to express with directive-based schemes. These also, you know, CUDA and OpenCL are, are very low level of abstraction. So, you know, all this stuff I'm talking about, about how the machine works, if you're using OpenACC, it's good to have a general understanding of this, but the compiler is going to try to do a lot of the hard stuff for you. But when you get into doing it with CUDA, it's sort of a different philosophy. CUDA and OpenCL are the philosophy that you, the programmer, are going to provide all the parallelism that there is. And you're going to gather it up, and you're going to hand it to the GPU, and it's going to tear through this calculation. Uh, but you, the programmer, are in charge of all of it. So that's a lot of responsibility. But the benefit of that is you can do all kinds of things that a compiler is not smart enough to do. Not now, maybe not next year, maybe not even in, in 20 years. So for example, we've been doing all kinds of things in CUDA and OpenCL that go back to 2007. I don't think in the next 10 years, I don't think there's any way any of the compilers would be able to do the same optimizations we've done by hand. So, you know, there's a, there's a continuum here. You can begin with libraries. When you get to the point that you've extracted what's possible with libraries, then you can add in using directives. When you've maxed out the directives or you reach memory bandwidth bound performance, you can start thinking about, do I have specific pieces where I could go further? And you just uh, make those decisions on a case by case basis. So what I would say, yeah, and so that's basically what I just described here is, you know, you should basically do your library drop in uh, and, and try that and then you should profile your code and see where things stand. Where do you spend all your runtime? Is If it's in data migration, that isn't really even writing new code. That's just making sure that you allocate memory uh, in the right places and keep all the, the data that you're manipulating uh, where the work is being done. And so then, uh, and if you've done that well and you're not being bound by PCI Express performance, things like that, then the profiler will show you that some particular operation is taking all your time, and then that becomes a candidate for adaptation to OpenACC or CUDA. If, if it was already in OpenACC and you want more performance, that's when you would start thinking about doing it in CUDA. And so you just do this in a loop, and you just play sort of a whack-a-mole game. Where is my time going now? And you just iteratively do this, and you just do this over and over and over. So, you know, we have a a molecular dynamics code in AMD, we've been playing this game now for 10 years. And so, you know, it never really ends. And because the GPU hardware keeps evolving and gets faster and they add new features that didn't exist before, over a moderate time frame, let's say three years, you might be able to get away with not changing too much over a three year time frame, but over a longer time frame, like five years, I would say you're almost guaranteed to be missing out on some aspect of some new performance because uh, NVIDIA keeps adding new features to these GPUs and that gives you more opportunities to extract speed. So what runs on a GPU? Uh, the, we, basically GPUs run a function but it's special and, and, and I'll show you how they're special but what, what they run is a little piece of code we call a kernel. And so uh, kernels are launched by a CPU host thread and to uh, maintain control over the sequence of operations that a GPU does, the host threads basically are in charge of creating a context. And so that context is sort of the, the CPU's communication channel to a particular hardware device uh, or to the library that manages that device. So that's the first thing you do. Once you've created a context, uh, 
Uh, you use that context to uh, manage things like memory allocation. So that's how you say, I want a memory allocation on that GPU. I want it to be this size. Uh, th I want to free it, all those kinds of things. Um, that's also how you do copies. So if, once you've done your allocation, you have a memory buffer, you can copy something from a host to a GPU or from the GPU back to the host. You can do it synchronously. You can do it asynchronously. So just like with MPI, you have MPI send and you have MPI I send. There are equivalent, uh, there's basically CUDA mem copy and CUDA mem copy async. So you have asynchronous versions of various calls. Same thing for launching kernels. Uh, if you want to find out, did the GPU encounter an error, or is it finished, or does uh, you know did it uh, want to send some result back to the host? There are APIs to query what's going on on the GPU side, and of course, then the CPU is also responsible for cleaning up anything uh, bad that happens. Like, did you ask for more memory than there was? Did a kernel have the GPU equivalent of a seg fault, for example? Uh, so. You have all the same things you'd have in, an, in a normal host side program, but now you have this extra responsibility sort of out of band control over what this thing is doing. So that's sort of the nature of any, any accelerator or coprocessor is going to have to have some management APIs, and this is largely what your host code needs to do that's sort of out of the ordinary from what it did before. Um, so how do you write kernels? Uh, one way, of course, that you already heard about is with OpenACC, so that's the directive-based approach. And then the other way is with explicit parallelism. So you, the programmer, describe all the parallelism up front, and you gather it up and describe it in a what we call a grid, and then you give that grid to the GPU runtime system, and you launch it. And that's how you run this kernel on the GPU. And as a, as a programmer, when you do it explicitly with CUDA or OpenCL, you have complete control over exactly which GPU memory system you use for what. And this is something that is where some of the magic happens. Um, I'll get into the details of this afternoon, but you saw those um, peak teraflop and peak gigaflop rates. I'll, I'll give you a little spoiler. If you have a, a GPU that can hit almost 10 teraflops in double precision, and you only have one terabyte of memory bandwidth, well, one double precision operand is eight bytes, right? So you have a, quite a gap in, this, in the memory bandwidth, even with a GPU, which with a, almost a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth, you have a lot more flops than you have memory bandwidth. So the GPU does have a bunch of special memory systems, and this is where some of the magic is. Or why, you know, why would you go beyond what OpenACC gives you? Well, some of the reasons would be to have exact control over these special memory systems. So this is an opportunity uh, that you can exploit. Uh, so how do you write one of these kernels? Basically, the process is akin to what you guys already learned for OpenACC. The first thing you look at in your code are loops, right? So you're going to look for big loops that have a huge number of iterations. Let's say 10 to 100,000 iterations would be nice. And they're doing independent work on each of those loop iterations. So you convert things that would have been a loop, or if they were on, let's say it was a host code or an MPI code, they would have been either independent threads or independent MPI ranks. And you're going to collect all that data parallel work and you're going to grab those up, put them in an array, explain them to the GPU, and you're going to say, go do this. And the way that this is done, it's, uh, we have these what we call grids and thread blocks, and they have an index space. You, you know, when you heard about MPI earlier in the week, you heard about MPI uh, com rank and MPI com size, right? That told you your, your individual MPI process's identity and then using that identity or that numbering, that indexing scheme, you were able to decide what that processing element should do. In exactly the same way, this is how we do things on the GPU. The GPU has a more complicated indexing system because it's a hierarchical, multi-dimensional indexing space. It's, it can be 1D, 2D, or 3D, not, not simply just 1D. And the hierarchy also has to do with the attributes of these processing units and their memory systems. And so we'll, we'll get on onto that a little bit later, but that's basically the difference. The concept is similar, so if you understood how to do it with MPI, CUDA should not be any harder for you. All, you just have to watch out for how the memory system behaves.
Um, and so, and that's basically the extra responsibilities. You, you, because you're deciding how this indexing is done, that's gonna affect how the memory systems on the GPU are used. So to give you an example, let's say I have some uh, 1D, 2D, or 3D computational domain. I've drawn a, a 3D domain that I've uh, decomposed into slices. So maybe I'm running a 2D slice of that on the GPU. I have an index space that covers the entire computa computational domain. But you know the interesting thing about the GPU is we have fixed chunk sizes. So we have what we call thread blocks. That's these little blue shaded uh, squares here uh, that, ha that I decomposed into little, uh, the little dot there being one of the threads. So here we have a two-dimensional thread block uh, uh, system, and we have laid that out in a 3D grid, or sorry, 2D grid of thread blocks. And one thing that's worth noting is basically here at the edge where I have shaded it red, this is some part of the index space that is outside the bounds of the computational problem I'm trying to solve. <coughs> so if this doesn't happen to be an even multiple, you know, these, these thread blocks are a fixed dimensionality in size. So we have a tiling here. They all have to be the same size. I can't have a half size thread block at the edge. They all have to be the same. So that means in my code, I have to handle this boundary condition explicitly. So I have to say, if, if that GPU thread index is beyond the work that we have to do, I have to do something to skip it, which isn't that big of a deal, but you need to know about it. Um, so you know we're going to, with the memory system, we have these tiny on-chip caches. Uh, there are several different kinds. And the way, again, we're hiding memory latencies by over, overloading this GPU with work. And so we want tens of thousands of independent work units. And when we look at a problem, what we're really after, you know, I've shown something sort of trivial here. We would want enough thread blocks that there are at least 100 or so thread blocks. To give you an example, what, why does that matter? Because uh, state-of-the-art Volta, that GPU has 80 SMs. So it's not like a four-core processor. It's more like 80 cores, and each of those things wants to have maybe 200 to 500 threads to keep it busy, okay? And, and so the way that the hardware distributes work is through these blocks. And so if I have 80 SMs, I need at least 80 blocks just so that each one of them gets one block, right? So this, this example I've given is actually sort of embarrassingly ridiculous. It's, it's too simple. This is not nearly enough uh, work for the GPU. So, in this case, I would say a 2D decomposition was not a good choice because there weren't enough tiles uh, to flood that GPU with work. Um, one of the things that's worth noting is because we, are, we don't have a cache-based machine, some of the decisions that people make in other HPC codes <coughs> for CPUs, one of the common uh, programming idioms that some CPU codes use is called a scatter pattern. So they will, because they only have maybe four threads, they will privatize some data structure. That means they make a copy of it. And then they have each of the four threads work on an independent copy of some data structure. And they can, you know, because there's no competition, they don't have to have things like mutex locks, things like this. They can just update any array element they feel like with impunity. And at a scale of four threads, this kind of thing works, right? If you have 100,000 threads, you can't really afford to have every thread having its own copy of a data structure. That, that entire concept just goes out the window. So you can have groups of threads cooperate to do things, but they can't have their own independent copies. So that means instead of you know, things where you have scatters on a CPU with a thread count of four, on a GPU, you have to sort of turn things inside out. Rather than scattering results out on writes to memory, on a GPU, it's okay for multiple threads to read something, but they can't, multiple threads can't write to the same thing or you have an output conflict. So that's a race condition, you know, bad stuff happens, right? Uh, so on a GPU, we sort of invert those kinds of strategies and I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, a GPU can use privatization, privatization schemes, but we don't do it at a thread level. We do it at the, at the level of a grouping of threads or maybe an entire thread block. Uh, 
not something that's at, as fine grained as a single thread. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pause and we can ask uh, questions and, I, and I'm gonna advise people. So every year there's a GPU technology conference, uh, sometimes multiple times per year. Uh, the latest one was in San Jose in the spring, uh, back in March. And there are about 700 recorded videos from each of these for the last, and, and, and uh, I mean, there's 700 for this year. And those are different from the 700 from last year. So there are so many videos on any topic you can think of, it is mind boggling. Anything you ever wanted to know about hardcore GPU programming, uh, visualization, HPC, graphics, AI, you name it, they are available <clears throat> through this uh, portal. You can go watch the previous years of recordings uh, for free. So it's a great resource uh, and that's worth looking at. And now I'll take uh, questions about this first material. Any questions here locally? Any questions remotely? In the chat area. There were some questions, but they were answered actually oh, yeah? in, in okay. Slack. Um, well, I'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, since we started early, I'm getting to do more material than I was originally bargaining for. So, uh, bargaining for, so I'll give you about 10 minutes to collect your thoughts, and uh, then we'll start up with the next session. Okay. John, there's one question. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about GPU floating point unit, especially when it comes to single and double precision? So they just want to know about the floating point units themselves? Yeah. Well, I would say um, GPU floating point units, uh, I guess I don't have uh, one of the hardware figures here. The floating point units that are on GPUs from 2007 on are conformant to IEEE floating points. So they behave the same way you would expect as a CPU uh, floating point unit. If you look in, there's a document, if you go to docs.nvidia.com, they have all the documentation for all of their programming uh, literature for everything there. And there's a document for CUDA called the CUDA Programming Guide. And the CUDA Programming Guide provides a, a lot of details, maybe more than most people care about, uh, about the exact accuracy of particular floating point operations when the GPU is in particular rounding modes. It'll tell you how many units least place error that those floating point units have for different operations. And you can uh, decide which way you want to use that hardware. Um, and they're also intrinsic. So for example, if you know that you don't need as much accuracy, uh, you can use different instructions that are approximations rather than the full accuracy uh, implementation that's provided as the standard uh, fare of CUDA. So you as a programmer have control over all of those things. If you want, uh, I mean, I think everything you can think of that's noteworthy is down in the range of uh, one or two units least place error, which is pretty standard. I think if you compare that against any CPU, you're in exactly the same ballpark. There are some places where GPUs actually have better uh, error behavior than uh, some other processors, like they do a enhanced precision multiply accumulate, things like that, so they have a bigger accumulation vector internally, and so if you do things the right way, you, you can have a little more precision than uh, some CPUs do. Um, but basically, they're standard IEEE, so you should expect the same basic behavior you observe on any other platform. No, another question, can you talk about NVLink and Summit and Sierra, bigger bandwidth between GPU and CPU memory? Sure. Uh, so this is sort of, I, I sort of, I wasn't sure how far to go with this hardware discussion because not everybody is, is that keen on all this stuff. But uh, one of the features we have that didn't exist before, actually I have a slide later today and I'll, I'll drop in a uh, summit slide somewhere. But let's say here, this, uh, I have a placeholder here. So I told you that uh, on a normal machine today, you're stuck using PCI Express to talk to the CPU. And that's true if you're using an x86 uh, Intel or AMD host machine. Uh, 
If you're on a IBM power machine, there is another option. Uh, so Summit is an IBM power machine and, and the IBM power processor and the new Volta GPUs and Pascal GPUs have an extra bus. So besides, they, they of course they do have PCI Express, but beyond PCI Express, they have another memory channel called NVLink. <clears throat> NVLink, rather than being 12 gigabytes a second, is about, uh, it's broken up into six, link, six links, and depending on the topology, they can achieve anywhere from, like on the Livermore Sierra machine, those links are providing you with 200 gigabytes per second between the GPUs. On the, it's, a, it's sort of a topology that looks kind of like this, but imagine instead of PCI Express at 12, you have 200 going to the processors and to the host memory. So that means you can do some things on uh, Sierra that you would never be able to do on a conventional x86 piece of hardware. Uh, you can use the large memory that the power processors have. They have about a half a terabyte of memory. So you can use that directly from the GPU. The GPU can read and write that host memory as, uh, as well as it does its own. And it's able to use that same latency hiding scheme that it uses for its own memory uh, when it accesses off-board off memory, and it can also access other GPUs' memory. Uh, Summit is basically the same thing, but instead of four GPUs, you have six. Because you have a larger number of GPUs, you have fewer links per GPU, so instead of 200 gigabytes per second, the effective bandwidth between them is down to 150. Um, and there's, a, I don't know if you guys have heard of, N NVIDIA has a really cool piece of hardware called a DGX2. A DGX2 is sort of a, a deep learning oriented uh, special purpose machine, uh, but some people are using them for HPC. And uh, it, what it has is a fully connected switch uh, that links all 16 GPUs together so that they can directly read and write each other's memory over NVLink. And because it's switched, all six channels from each GPU go to each switch, switch link, and that allows each GPU to see 300 gigabytes a second to any of its peers. And so that allows you, so this is why, if you've, if you've seen some of these deep learning benchmarks NVIDIA has uh, posted in the recent uh, months, they are just killing it on those uh, benchmarks, and part of the reason why is they're running these things on DGX2s, which have these fully interconnected memory systems. So you have 16 GPUs with a half a terabyte of interconnected memory, and they can directly read and, re read and write each other's memory at bandwidths that are way be uh, beyond anything that a, a similar host machine would be able to do to its own uh, CPU sockets. So that's a pretty awesome hardware feature. And I would say that, you know, in, in my mind, that is, uh, that's where things have to continue growing. One of the most exciting developments with NVLink is that the new Turing GPUs, now in my talks today, I'm really focused on HPC-oriented GPUs, but the new gaming GPUs, the Turing GPUs that just came out that have uh, features like ray tracing and all that, they also, for the first time ever, have put NVLink channels on the commodity GPUs. That's pretty exciting. Uh, that means for the first time ever, uh, we should be able to start doing things uh, like what we do on the supercomputers on sort of mid-range or high-end uh, uh, consumer gaming boxes. Um, any other questions? There was a question from Argon. Uh, I guess they, they... Speak up. There is a question from Argon National Lab. Go for it. They will ask that question themselves. Is there a question at Argon? We can't hear you. Go ahead. If you're working on a system that has PCI connections, are there libraries that optimize problems that go across multiple GPUs? 
So I believe the question was if you're if you're writing uh, software running on a machine with PCI Express, are there libraries that optimize the communication to avoid going over the links or to minimize that? And uh, my answer is yes. There are there are definitely a number of libraries that are topology aware. Uh, so I think you know, uh, for example, so NVIDIA makes a library called NVML. And that is a library that allows you to query a whole bunch of low-level uh, attributes of the GPU, and, and not only the GPU, but the machine that it's in, and how all the GPUs are interconnected. And um, there is another open source library called HWLOC, and it also uh, can gather topo topological information about all the buses in the machine and the placement of accelerators, CPU cores, NUMA, NUMA uh, nodes and all that kind of stuff. And those tools have been used by a number of libraries to automate the data layout and placement uh, of large matrices and things to give better performance by being topology aware of the internals to a node. And so they can, all, they can actually do this, you know, today you can do this all automatically. But uh, 10 years ago we didn't have uh, libraries or APIs for this, but now that they exist, HW, I don't know if you know about this, but HWLOC, for example, is used by all of the major MPI implementations to be aware of the topology of InfiniBand cards and to decide how to place MPI ranks on CPUs and all that. So basically, you're seeing, what you're seeing now today is that they are extending HWLOC to exploit libraries like NVML and then make that information available so that MPI implementations and libraries can use the hardware topology to give uh, better performance. Does that, does that answer your question? Let's hope so. <laughs> well, I'll give them another minute or so for questions and then I guess we'll continue. All right, well, if there's no more questions, we'll go on. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of uh, reiterate how we're going to design CUDA kernels. Um, so the beginning, you know, as I've described, you need, you know, 20,000, 100,000 threads to keep a GPU busy, to get all those arithmetic units uh, woken up out of their sleep. And we need to, we need to find a pl uh, places in our code where we have that kind of parallelism. And the next thing we want to consider is, for CUDA, we need to decide where we're going to store the data that those threads are going to work with. There are multiple GPU memory systems, and they have different rules that govern how they are accessed uh, with peak performance. And so you need to consider that uh, when you're deciding where to place the data that you're operating on. And you can make uh, trade-offs sometimes to do extra arithmetic now this is, this is kind of bizarre to some people. If you've been doing this a long time, you might find this to be a strange uh, strategy. But GPUs are so arithmetic uh, performant that sometimes it's a better idea to do some redundant arithmetic or to, to favor doing arithmetic rather than storing something in memory. Because the cost of reading and writing memory, as you've already heard, there's a big gap between the memory bandwidth and the, the flop rate that we can achieve we might actually get better performance by doing arithmetic. I just had a, a colleague of mine was giving a presentation uh, just the other day, and he was uh, concerned about the fact that we might have to calculate something twice in a molecular simulation. And, and I said, calculating it twice is of no concern. It's practically free. What's not free is writing it to disk or communicating it over the network or anything like that. I said, I, as far as the GPU is concerned, arithmetic costs you nothing because you saw the whole the chip is full of arithmetic units. That's what it does well. So we have to worry more about the memory systems and about uh, data migration and not so much about doing the math itself. Um, and then we basically want to find another, you know, interesting problem you have with GPUs is you, because we have these fixed size thread blocks and we are going to launch those into these grids, 
depending on the size of your problem, if your problem is in, let's say your problem lies on the small end of the spectrum, not that many uh, work units, you might want to have uh, different implementations of the same code. I might choose a big thread block size when I have huge problems, and I might choose a smaller thread block size if I have a small problem. And you, you may ask, well, why would you do that? And that goes back to that uh, observation I made earlier. Like a state-of-the-art Volta, it has 80 SMs. We have to have at least 80 thread blocks just to provide each SM with one uh, chunk of work to do. If we have less than 80 thread blocks, the GPU is actually work starved. And so we want to maintain a situation where, you have, where we have many thread blocks per SM. And so that might mean that rather than just implementing a kernel with one decomposition strategy, we might make two different kernels, one for big problems and one for small problems. And when you've seen performance charts, uh, like I showed during the li library's talk yesterday, that's why you see spiky performance curves, because you're finding some architectural uh, you know, edge or a, 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 a chunk size that gives better performance on some range of problem sizes than it does on the other. And that's even true on CPUs. So uh, this is why we sometimes write multiple kernels for the same thing. Again, arithmetic is free. So forget, you know, a lot of people have spent a large part of their time writing their code, figuring out how many floating point operations they're doing. When we're writing code for a GPU, it just doesn't matter. The floating point is, is so effectively free, it's the last thing we worry about literally the last thing. We don't care about the flops, but we very much care about memory bandwidth and I.O. and uh, copying things between different memory buffers. Those are the things we have to keep track of. <clears throat> the highest bandwidth memory you have on a GPU is what we call machine registers. So how many people know what a register is on any processor? Okay, well, a register is like a super high speed, tiny piece of memory that's embedded into the arithmetic units themselves uh, they're actually replicated on a large scale within the pipelines of most processors. And if you keep your data in registers, they are able to run at the full speed of the, of the microprocessor. So they have no performance gap. But there aren't very many of those things. There are about, uh, let's say on a GPU, a middling number of registers for a typical uh, workload would be, let's say, 32 registers. So if you can imagine having some algorithm where you have 32 local variables and some loop. If you can keep that loop running using values that are just in those 32 local variables, a compiler is going to generate code. It's going to put those in machine registers, and that code will run at the peak arithmetic rate of that hardware. So that's pretty exciting. But a lot of people have code that doesn't meet that criteria. If you have a big uh, blob, if you're doing dense linear algebra, you're doing that A of I equals B of I plus C of I, and you have a half a terabyte array, sorry, you're, you're going to be loading something from a big DRAM array. You're going to place it in a register, and unfortunately, that, that's going to be bound by the, the memory performance, not by registers. Um, and so, you know, registers are the thing we want to use the most, but we have other options. And I'll get to those next. So the work abstraction we have in CUDA, they're called threads. You know, these are not the same thing as CPU threads. Um, I didn't really get into this up to now, but uh, now is where we talk about the details. Uh, in a CUDA thread is really like a SIMD lane. So when you were introduced to state-of-the-art CPUs, CPUs have these SIMD vector units and they will do the same operation on numerous operands at the same time. Like, uh, let's say, a uh, nice uh, Intel processor or AMD would now do a vector of eight operands at a time. See, so if you want to add them uh, to some other vector, you can do that. You want to divide, you want to multiply. Well, a GPU is basically doing the same thing, except for it works on, in the NVIDIA case, it works on vectors of 32 of these things at a time. and. So those vectors are much larger. And the other thing that's different is um, while a CPU, it, it really is true SIMD, these GPUs, as I described earlier, they have a hardware multi-threading that makes things a little more complicated, but there's a benefit to it for you, which is that when you do things like branch instructions, on a CPU, there really isn't a way to do that on a vector of numbers, right? You can't do a, an if-then 
on 16 different numbers, how is that supposed to work, right? A compiler would have to generate a bunch of special code to deal with that. A GPU actually has a way of dealing with that, but, and it's, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but it's uh, constrained in various ways. So unlike a CPU thread that can go off and do anything it wants, on a GPU, while it's not as restrictive as the SIMD vectors that we have on a CPU, it's similar. So you want to keep that in the back of your mind. And these GPU threads, uh, you know, we're largely trying to run these concurrently. Certainly, um, all the threads within one of these groups of 32 were, were definitely running at the same time. Those are happening exactly in, in sort of a lockstep fashion. But they're being scheduled across that giant pool of arithmetic hardware we described earlier. So here's a diagram. This is the, the older NVIDIA Kepler GPUs. These are what's in blue waters, okay? <clears throat> The newer GPUs are basically a re-parameterization of the same thing. They have different numbers of these uh, graphics processor clusters and SMs and so on and, and different numbers of single precision and double precision and special function units and load store units. But, you know, it's just a, a variation of the same thing and, and of course they've made improvements. So they changed the numbers to give them the best bang for the buck in terms of the number of gates that they use and all these other choices. So I would say this is a good enough example. You don't need the fact that this diagram doesn't show Volta or it doesn't show Kepler or it doesn't show, uh, or sorry, it doesn't show uh, Turing shouldn't matter to you much. As far as you're concerned, this is the 99% of what you're interested in programming here. So the thing to observe is you have a, a the diagram in the top left, you have a, the GPU as a whole, right? So it has a big DRAM that's shared by all of these uh, subunits. These graphics processor clusters are not that important to you except that they have some caches that are shared. That's really the only thing that matters that you're concerned with. They break up into SMs. So there's a couple of SMs sharing some hardware there in one of those units. And those SMs, this is what runs one of those thread blocks, right? So one of these SMs has a 64K constant cache. This is a special memory system that allows you to store a small array. And if all the threads in a thread block read the same thing at the same time, it gives you the same performance, roughly speaking, as if it had been in a machine register. So that is to say that 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 cache is able to feed that hardware at the peak arithmetic speed. So if you have some kind of uh, lookup table or something like this and you know that the access pattern will fill that, fulfill that requirement that all the threads hit it at the same time with the same element, you'll get a tremendous uh, performance from that. <clears throat> There's also an L1 cache shared memory. So this is a, another piece of hardware that sort of serves two purposes. It is basically access, it's ac acting as an L1 cache for your general memory accesses. It can also act as a scratch pad memory, sort of a, a shared on-chip memory that the threads within a, a particular thread block or a particular warp, which I'll talk about later, they can exchange values with each other. So this is like when you do an MPI, you want to do something like a reduction. Shared memory is a special place where all the threads can read and write temporary data and they can exchange values through that memory. So that's a, a, an important detail. <clears throat> we also have a 48K texture memory now. So those of you that don't do graphics, you'll say, what is a texture? So a texture is a 1D, 2D, or 3D grid of values, scalar values in many cases but in, uh, for HPC. But in computer graphics, they're vector values, so they are things like colors. Um, but they can be single precision floating point numbers. They can be integers of various sizes. And uh, the texture unit can do some special things, like it can do linear interpolation with a certain finite accuracy, about, I think it's eight bits of fractional component, um, automatically in hardware. So that's something that's independent. So by by reading from that special texture unit, you can get it to do math for you without actually using any of the arithmetic units that are part of the SM itself. So now if we look in here, um, these little SPs, these are single precision arithmetic units. DPs are double precision arithmetic units. LDST is load store. So all of the GPUs from Kepler on 
are what we call uh, load store architectures. So they're much more like a, a risk processor. They have a sort of a, a more minimalistic instruction set. They have very simple uh, addressing modes. This makes their instruction set simpler to, to implement with a decoder. And it makes it easier for compilers to generate code that achieves a high fraction of their uh, theoretical performance. Not as easy for a human to write assembly code for, though. <laughs> so that's the trade-off. So they're you know, much like a classic risk machine in that regard. Uh, so that means that if you want to operate on something from an array, uh, your code is going to have to generate a load, a load instruction and pull that operand into a register that's in the machine. Uh, before you can actually do, you know, before you can say add or subtract those numbers, it has to be in a register. And similarly, if you want to write something back out to memory, there's going to be a store instruction. One of the interesting things that's cool about Kepler is not only are these uh, different elements data parallel, but actually if your code does math that's independent of the load store, it can be doing load stores at the same time it's doing math. So that's great. That means you're able to overlap memory accesses and things like this with arithmetic. And you can see the numbers here. You can do a lot of single precision arithmetic. Uh, you can do a good amount of double precision arithmetic. SFU are special function units. So we actually have a dedicated piece of hardware on a GPU for doing things like exponentials, square roots, sine and cosine. Um, this is, you know, one of my personal favorite parts of GPUs is we get all these advanced uh, transcendental functions as hardware machine instructions that are very fast. So, you know, when I was talking about libraries yesterday, I gave CFIS as an example where you could go online and look and see what's inside of sine or cosine, what's inside of exponential routines. If you've gone over and looked at that, you'll see that one of those uh, routines on a CPU works out to several hundred lines of code in C, right? So they're not trivial little things to do. And so having one of those things as a machine instruction means that right there, for a CPU to do that, it's going to have to run several hundred instructions. A GPU can do the same operation for the ones it has in one instruction. That is a huge delta in performance. So I have, for example, uh, that quantum chemistry loop I talked about yesterday where I do that special uh, approximated exponential on a CPU. Even with all the tricks I've ever been able to use on a CPU, the GPU is still almost 100 times faster at running that piece of code. Why? Because it has special function units that do those transcendentals in hardware, and there is no way to make uh, a machine that doesn't have that it's just night and day. And you might say, well, why does GPU have that? Well, it turns out we need those things for computer graphics. We need exponentials as part of the lighting equations we do to, to shade things and make pretty pictures for video games. We need fast reciprocal square roots to normalize vectors, for, again, for computer graphics. We need fast square roots for computer graphics. We need all these uh, other uh, special functions. So GPUs are very uh, special function rich compared to other hardware architectures, which makes them great for uh, people working in domains that involve a lot of uh, these special math functions. So this is a great opportunity to, be, to make yourself aware of. <clears throat> so now if we're uh, putting this work on the GPU, these thread blocks get mapped onto one of those uh, GPU SMs. So the blue tiles, these thread blocks, basically the GPU hardware, when I launch work on it, it is going to multiplex those blue tiles onto those hardware units. And uh, like I said, on a state-of-the-art Volta, there's 80 of those SMs. So I need at least 80 thread blocks just to have one per, per SM. And really, it's nice to have more like three or four. <clears throat> so when we write CUDA, now we're getting into the CUDA syntax itself. So we basically decorate uh, what would look like a normal C function we decorate it with this special uh, global declaration. And that basically tells the NVCC compiler that we're going to take this function and generate code that can run on the GPU. Uh, so this little global my kernel, it looks a lot like any other C function, except that the return type has to be void. And that's because the GPU, the way that we're going to exchange things back and forth with the host is through copies. So we're going to use a, 
mem copy mechanism to exchange outputs and things like this. So basically stuff goes in, the compiler will pack all of your parameters and copy it to the GPU for you, but anything you want to send back has to be done by different means. So then within a kernel, the language, CUDA, you know, it's like C, except for we have some extra stuff, and the, uh, the key extra things are these three special variables, block index, block dim, and grid dim, and those are the, those are the equivalent of the MPI com rank and MPI com size, right? So they're kind of, these are how we do our index space, and they are 1D, 2D, or 3D, and, and so we treat them like uh, XYZ vectors, and, whoops, uh, sorry. And so we treat those as vectors, and using those, we can compute which thread we are and what work we should be doing and so on. And the way we launch, once we've written a kernel, the way the code looks to launch it, we are going to give the name of the, the kernel that we wrote, and then we have this three uh, triple chevron syntax followed by the grid dimensions, so that's how many thread thread blocks in each XYZ dimension, and then the, the number of threads in each dimension for each of those thread blocks. So that's that fixed tiling pattern I was describing. So when you write something in OpenACC, the compiler is picking all these things and doing it for you, and you're kind of unaware that any of this is even going on. When you write it in CUDA, the decision is yours. So you get to make this decision, you get to specify exactly how you want it decomposed. For some problems it doesn't matter that much, but there are many problems where it matters a great deal, and so that's why you may want to have that control. And again, this is then how it sort of maps out on the hardware. So we've seen that before. So now, okay, great, that sounds easy enough, right? Uh, how do I use those grid dim, block dim, and thread index, and so on? How do I figure out which work item I should be working on? So <clears throat> we'll work through this real slowly. So let's start and let's just think of a 1D indexing, right? So if we just want a long 1D vector, we can use, sorry, we can use this grid dim here. So that's basically telling us how many thread blocks in a particular dimension. The block dim is how many threads within a block. Block index is which thread am I, right? And then uh, thread index, uh, sorry, yeah, which block index is which block am I, and thread index is which thread am I. So block dim, if we set block dim to 256, each of those threads within that block will get an index that is zero based, so it goes from zero to 255, right? Straightforward. Uh, if I then have a grid of these blocks, if I have 1,024 blocks in a grid, I'm going to have block zero, block index zero, is going to have thread index zero to 255. The next block index one will also have thread zero to 255. So that, since you see this repeating pattern, right, if I want to find a global thre thread index, the way I do that in CUDA is I multiply my block index times the block dimensionality, right? That gives me a global sort of the, the for the zero thread, it gives you the global index of that zero thread, and then I add my thread index within that thread block to that, and that gives me my global thread index that's unique among all threads. So that is sort of literal, the literal equivalent of MPI com size and you know, MPI com rank. This is how you get the CUDA equivalent of MPI com rank. Com size would be sort of uh, you know, multiplying the grid dim times the block dim. That's the equivalent of MPI comp size. Any questions at this moment? This is a good point to make sure you're all on the same page. Everybody's good? No questions. All right, good. So, how do we use that in a kernel? Uh, it's not too bad. This is a simple uh, add kernel, so it looks just like a piece of C code. You could imagine that we would have done this with a loop, right? So we're taking what was a trivial loop for i equals zero to some number, you know, uh, and we're basically launching all those loop iterations all at once. So that means that every thread that we're launching has to compute its own index, its global index, and it's going to use that to decide which elements of the array to read and write. 
And so for this problem, it's trivial, right? This is all we have to do. So basically, when we launch this kernel, we're going to specify a, a block size, the number of blocks in each dimension for that grid. And then when we, if, uh, this is presuming a 1D uh, decomposition. And when we run it, this is basically going to do all those iterations at once. Now, you remember we were talking before about what if the work isn't evenly divisible into uh, even multiples of blocks, right? So let's say that my total work is n, and n is not some nicely divisible number. Like, it's not divisible by 32, it's not divisible by 3, it's, it's some random, uh, let's say it's a prime number, how about that? Uh, well, then we have to do something so that we don't go off the end of the array. Just like when you write the code in a loop, you can't have your loop go beyond the bounds of the array or you're going to seg fault, right? You're going to crash your program. In the same way in CUDA, we, if we have an irregularly sized or non-even multiple work units versus uh, tile size, we have to add a little if test and basically say, if my index is within bounds, do the work, otherwise don't. And so that's one way to handle it. The other way to handle it would be to pad the work so that it is an even multiple. So you could put a bunch of zeros in an array, for example. And so if you wanted to make your code run ever so slightly faster, it might be a good choice to get rid of this if test and just force your work to be an exact multiple of the block size. So that's something that you have control over. OpenACC isn't going to be able to do that. OpenACC is going to do what you told it to do. And it, this is one of those details in CUDA, you have control over this. In a directive-based scheme, you're trusting the compiler to make choices for you. But things like padding out your, your arrays, it's not going to be doing fundamental changes to your data structure. It's going to leave those things the way they are. So if they're suboptimal, it's going to live with that. But in CUDA, you, 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 have, you come face to face with this immediately in your code, and you say, gosh, I don't want that if test in the middle of my fast code. So you could choose to pad out your array rather than have to do this test. So this is one of those you know, tiny little details you have control over. So what does it look like to actually launch that little silly kernel? Uh, this is a little you know, piece of code here, an example. Basically, uh, if we started running CUDA, we would compute uh, some size. We have to do a memory allocation, a CUDA malloc. It looks just like malloc in C would have looked except we have to get the address back so we don't, you know, it's not a return like it is in the normal malloc. We then have to copy our inputs from the host to the device. So let's say we read something from a disk file, right? And we had it in some local array called uh, A on the host, and we wanted to copy it to A GPU. The way we do that, let's say we read it into A already, then we just use this CUDA mem copy, A GPU to A, or A to A GPU of size. And this little flag here, CUDA mem copy host to device, basically says which direction the copy is going. It's going from the host to the device. If we want to copy it back, the only thing we'd have to change is uh, say CUDA mem copy device to host. You can also have CUDA mem copy device to device. So the individual who was asking before about things like NVLink, it, when you have a machine that has NVLink, when you are copying something, the CUDA runtime will know if it's possible to use a faster channel like NVLink versus using PCI Express, and it will use the faster channel. So if you've done things the right way and you've allocated your memory properly and, and you've told it that it's allowed to use it, then all that stuff will happen automatically for you. Um, so here we're setting this block size. I'm, I'm choosing a block size that I think is good. <clears throat> As guidance, I would say, <clears throat> since the GPU hardware unit works with uh, 32 threads in, in tightly coupled groups, uh, block has to be at least 32, but it's better for hiding various uh, hardware latencies if the block size is a little bigger. So I would say the minimum really is about 64. And a good size, a, a sweet spot for a lot of people's code is either 64 or 256. So these are nice multiples of 32, so you don't have any ragged edges. 
Uh, all those ALUs and one of those GPU uh, SMs will be used appropriately. Um, and so that's a, a kind of, you can try uh, different multiples of 32, but I happen to, I almost always begin with either 64 or 256. And <clears throat> the size of the thread block is just based on how, what's my average problem size. If my average problem size is 10 million, then I might choose a, a bigger block size. If my average problem size is 10,000, then I probably choose a minimalistic block size uh, to make sure I have plenty of thread blocks to distribute over a GPU that has a lot of SMs. <clears throat> so once we choose the block size, we compute how many blocks there have to be. That's what this little rounding business is doing. This is basically computing the next, it's like the next number of blocks beyond. So if we have something that's not an even multiple, this is one, one more full block to cover that ragged edge. And this is then of course the block size and we're launching that code and it's running on the GPU. Now, how do you know when it's done? Well, this is uh, by default, CUDA is gonna go off and these things are gonna run and you won't realize when, they're, when they have finished or not so that we have APIs. If you need to know that it's done, and uh, you need to call something like CUDA device synchronize. So this really comes up when you start timing your code, right? If you, if you were to put this code in there and you didn't realize that that CUDA ad is gonna run, you know, it's gonna run asynchronously and it's not gonna block your CPU, if you put a timer call right after it, you'd, it's, you'd get this uh, runtime, it'd say, oh, well, CUDA ad took a nanosecond or whatever, but really it's still running. So for you to know that it's finished, you would have to uh, call CUDA device synchronize. Another way of finding out that something is finished is if you wait until after a memory copy. Memory copies, will def will, they will block until the thing before them has finished. So if you launch a kernel and then you do a memory copy, the memory copy will have to wait until the kernel is finished running. So that's a, you know, a little detail about those things. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, resource allocation and deallocation, once we're done uh, doing our code, we'd have to free up our three arrays and so on. Any questions about this so far? So far, so good. It's a pretty simple example, but, you know, it's a, I want you guys to have the solid foundation here because Dimitri is going to run you guys through some linear algebra examples this afternoon. So you're going to have two hours of, of real uh, hands-on CUDA this afternoon with Dimitri. And the better you understand this indexing stuff, the simpler it will be when you go on to do the hands-on. So the better, you, if you have any questions, don't be bashful. Let's go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, I'll, I'll continue. All right. So... There are many ways now with state-of-the-art GPUs to deal with memory allocation and deallocation. One of the things that NVIDIA improved over time, you, you saw what this code looked like, right? You know, we had to do this memory allocation on the GPU, we had to copy things to it, and then finally we got to launch our kernel. <clears throat> over several generations of hardware, NVIDIA improved the GPU, so it is able to uh, do some magic tricks, which I won't explain. But basically, it is able to uh, manage memory transfers for itself using a combination of fancy software and hardware. <clears throat> but that, uh, there are times when you want to do it yourself. You want to exactly manage those things. Uh, a ninja programmer, as we might say, can always beat uh, the magic hardware and software. So it's good to know how to do it if you have to do it the old school way. And, and a lot of GPUs still in the field. So for example, the uh, Tesla K20X that's in Blue Waters, it is the older hardware. It doesn't have these magic tricks, so you actually have to do it like this. Um, and so uh, the way we allocate memory, as I described before, is CUDA malloc. It looks basically like malloc. It's a GPU virtual address, so if you touch this memory on the host, it's going to crash. You know, the, the host doesn't know what that address means. It is an it is a address space that doesn't necessarily exist. And so this is only, this virtual address that you get back from CUDA malloc is only valid on the GPU. Um, CUDA memcopy works just like regular memcopy, except for we have this extra parameter uh, describing where, you know, it's going to and from the host and the device. The main thing is to make sure that you've got those uh, parameters straight so that your destination is what you say it is, uh, 
Uh, otherwise, if you mi mix that up, that would be a good way to crash uh, or cause the GPU to behave badly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's pretty straightforward. And then CUDA 3 basically deallocates uh, that memory. So the, the automated transfers, so beginning with uh, NVIDIA's Pascal GPUs. So these are the, the older generation that's now been uh, superseded. Uh, these are about three years old. Uh, they were the first GPUs that had this hardware. So they have hardware page tables, and they can basically do things like detect when you're trying to touch memory that isn't on the GPU. So they make a, like a, I guess I would describe it as a shadow image of the virtual memory of the host. And, and they, the GPU is aware of not only its own memory, but it's also aware of the host's memory. And so you can do interesting things like have the GPU access things out of the host's memory, and it will transfer them on the fly and keep track of where the data is automatically. So what does that mean to you? That means that if you, if you use this CUDA malloc managed, the hardware and driver will work together to automatically move things around to wherever the work is happening as it happens. So if the GPU touches the memory, the hardware and the driver will copy that data to the GPU so that it can do that work as the work is happening. Uh, similarly, if you try to touch it on the host, it'll move it back. Now, this also means that if you're not careful, you can, uh, if you have a disorganized calculation, you could inadvertently have them thrashing, you know, sort of copying things back and forth uh, excessively. So you don't want to do that. But in the well-behaved case, you know, sort of the normal case, the beauty of this is you take something that looked like this originally, right? This is maybe some original old school GPU code, the old way we do it in CUDA for, uh, stuff like Kepler and earlier GPUs, and using the managed uh, CUDA malloc managed API, you get to delete the specific host allocations and the specific copy instructions, and you're left with the malloc managed, malloc managed, do the init on the CPU, do the kernel on the GPU, do the CPU stuff, free, free, done. And so you've cut the code down significantly, and it's a lot easier to deal with this. So this is kind of nice. You're, you know, this is not necessarily as fast as doing it the other way explicitly because the GPU is kind of, you're, everything is reactionary, right? You couldn't, if you don't warn the GPU that you're going to do something, it is going to have to move that memory at the moment that the work begins. The advantage of doing it explicitly is you can perform that transfer when the hardware is otherwise idle, while you're waiting for some pending MPI message to arrive, you can find some place to overlap that by hand. If you do it with the managed API, it makes the code tremendously easier to write, which is great. And for debugging and software development, this is a godsend. So I would absolutely use it. Uh, but if you want the peak performance that's possible, if you're after the speed of light, you have to keep in mind uh, that you may want to evaluate could I have overlapped a transfer with something else that was going on, whether it was disk I.O. or a message being passed or some CPU work or whatever? And so, uh, yeah, somebody had a question. Can we overlap multiple CUDA mem copy? So you can. Uh, in fact, this I didn't get into this detail of the hardware. If we go back to the diagram of the GPU, one of the functional units that's not in this picture is there are uh, extra copy units. So there are basically hardware units that their mission in life is just to copy data from the host to the device or between GPUs. And uh, the higher end Teslas, not only do they have uh, separate copy units to copy from the host to the device and the device to the host, but the state of the art GPUs have several uh, copies of those. So you can be doing <coughs> multiple copies concurrently in both directions at the same time. I, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but PCI Express is a uh, bus that's laid out with different signal paths in each direction. So that means that you can be copying up and down concurrently at full speed. And so this is why, uh, for example, GPU has multiple of these copy engines. You can be exchanging data in both directions at the same time, and you can be doing that while kernels are running, and you can have multiple of those copies queued up in different uh, asynchronous streams, as they're called, so that they can all take place at the maximum capability of the hardware. 
There are, uh, there's a CUDA API called CUDA Get Device Properties, and you can use this to query the capabilities of the GPU. All, all these different details, like what is the ratio of single precision versus double precision performance, uh, how many asynchronous copy units does the GPU have, all these kinds of things. These are things that you can query at runtime, so you can you know, inform your code how to use them. But really, it's simpler than that. If you provide the GPU the opportunity by expressing things with asynchronous APIs and by queuing up a bunch of work that can all go at the same time, the GPU hardware and runtime system will automatically exploit that and uh, co-schedule all those things across whatever hardware it has. Other questions? Uh, no, no questions, but just to clarify, um, were you talking about CUDA mem, uh, mem CPY or CPY async? So, mem yeah, so CUDA mem copy is synchronous. CUDA mem copy async, which I didn't show, is asynchronous. And so they, it takes an extra parameter, which is a thing called a stream. <clears throat> so it looks just like this. It just has one more parameter. <clears throat> and that stream basically is like a, a queue you could think of. So I've shown you this uh, kernel. All of this stuff is running on what we call the default stream or stream zero because we didn't specify it, it's assumed. Uh, but I can have many streams and they are independent of each other. So then I can uh, basically run things concurrently. That's how concurrency at the highest level is obtained is by submitting things to these different stream queues. All right, thank you. I just wanted to clarify that the question was uh, specific about mem CPY, and y your explanation was was well, for mem copy async. Yeah, async. sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mem and I would say in general you want. I, I would advocate everybody to use asynchronous APIs, just like you would with MPI. You, you don't use synchronous sends or synchronous uh, blocking APIs except for when you have to. You want to uh, exploit overlapping of copies of kernel launches, uh, all these different things. To do that, you have to use asynchronous APIs. There's a and you know to launch a kernel with a, a asynchronous um, to a different stream. There's an extra parameter, so that you don't see it here. It's assumed to be zero if you don't provide it. But that's basically how those things are done. You know, my goal today isn't to turn you into CUDA ninjas so much as get you on your, on your two feet and succeed at getting your first several kernels. You know, there are many things um, about performance tuning CUDA and getting it to exploit all these different hardware units that you can still learn, you know, over the coming weeks and months. But it's most important to me that you just get the basics. Once you get the basics, things like using asynchronous APIs, it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's not... Uh, surprising and, and it, given your experience with other APIs that have the similar constructs like MPI has exactly the same sorts of con, uh, considerations uh, I think it'll be pretty straightforward for all of you to learn to use those things <laughs>